today, the First Lady, and she's expressed a desire to sing our, our, our song. So, here's how we do it. I hope Gary has forgotten the tune. I hope you haven't forgotten the words. I hope I haven't forgotten the words. And I hope you haven't forgotten the words. Ah, one. Ah, two. Ah, three. Take me out to the floor. quarterback on the 10th of September 2018. We are making uh, some uh, programming changes uh, here at WBRN <laughs> Radio and the Boston Red Network. What we are doing is including some things in our broadcast starting to integrate uh, some of them together, some of the content at least. In uh, this broadcast, we'll have a little segment from Numbers Man. That is our economic uh, broadcast uh, from the macro field. It'll be about jobs and the working class from the Washington Post. And then from All About Sports, that is our sports broadcast, We'll have a little essay, or perhaps you want to call it a polemic or an op-ed, by Billy Jean King on Serena Williams and how her treatment is different. You probably heard about this before. And we'll start off with politics, a sort of um, introduction to 9-11 DNA tools that will be used to find the identity of people that were not available on that uh, fateful day in September the 11th. I'm not certain if we'll have special programming for 9-11 or not. That uh, we'll have to think about uh, from an editorial standpoint. And we'll look at uh, some governor's races, including the one out in Oregon, uh, that is Kate Brown out there. And we also have some states uh, like the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where old Charlie Baker is running for re-election. We've looked at this uh, phenomenon before and how to uh, solve it. And we'll have the baseball scores and the college football scores from the weekend. But let's uh, get to it now as we uh, try to make sense of this. And also we'll have the uh, talk shows from <coughs> excuse me, from NBC, uh, Meet the Press, an interview uh, with Kellyanne Conway. Kellyanne Conway, Conway will be elaborating on the anonymous op-ed in the uh, New York Times describing the dysfunctionality. That's the only way you can explain it of the uh, Trump White House and of DJ Trump. And also the uh, Woodward book. Two pieces that are coming out. And she elaborates about the uh, Trump supporters now. They would not care about this. They rest in a sea of alternative facts as she coined that term. Fake news whatever, is a dangerous precedent in that, as D.J. Trump himself said, he could kill someone on 42nd Street or on Broadway, I forget what the term was, and his supporters would still support him. There's no doubt about uh, that particular item. 
to his supporters, he is the leader, the Fuhrer. They show their allegiance to him, and it's all wrapped up in many, many things, at least his core supporters. The flag, pretty much that is where it is wrapped up. Their idea of what patriotism is, however perverted it in reality is, the idea of immigration and the immigration of people that do not look like them from the Americas primarily Guatemala El Salvador Mexico and from Arab countries these are issues the administration has addressed. The latest in denying $25 million to a medical center in a Palestinian territory. We'll jump a little bit upon that as we round up much of the news. Looking at it from the White House standpoint, when you have a dysfunctional White House a step that is literally babysitting there as quote unquote the adults in the room. And then you have a situation that you did not have in Watergate. If you recall, for those that were in the 70s, we had something called Deep Throat. And John Dean was the center of attention. He's still around, he was the White House counsel at the time. And he laid out the Watergate conspiracy. And, of course, we also had uh, the Nixon tapes, which did, in fact, uh, see the light of day, most of them. And that was the backdrop. But now we have the uh, op-ed in the New York Times. And literally, the heads of various cabinet departments from Mad Dog Mantis to uh, Papillon, to Vice President uh, Pence, and even Ben Carlson, all deny that they wrote the op-ed. And many of them spoke, or were spoken uh, for by uh, members of their general staffs. But this is very interesting in itself to have all of these people deny it. Was it a member of the uh, staff, a high-ranking member? Could have been Kellyanne Conway, to all we know. Could have been uh, Pence because of a word that he used there, or it could have been deliberate to use his uh, particular word that is uh, in itself a uh, It was load something, and, and I'd not heard the term before either. But nonetheless, he used it in a number of speeches. But this type of situation is a uh, deep Freudian uh, type situation. The difference is that Deep Freud was an official of the FBI that lived into his 90s and finally told, I think his name was Rich finally said he was in fact the person. But in this instance, the at least the possibility that the uh, deep Freudian type person is one of the people that denied it. Only history will uh, tell us that. But the descriptions between the uh, op-ed piece in the Times and Bob Woodward's book, over 400 pages, well documented. He interviewed over a hundred people. He has hundreds of hours of taped interviews. He worked in a systematic manner that a journalist would actually work in. So in other words, he has collaboration from these people that did in fact get on the tape. Now, we assume that many of the people uh, on the tape were people like uh, Rob uh, 
Portland, uh, I think his name was Portland, the White House Secretary, Cohen, the uh, economic advisor, that are no longer in the administration, that were either ousted or they departed. There's a bunch of those people were thrown onto the uh, bus by D.J. Trump. And there are others that are still around. It could be any of those. And as Kellyanne Conway pointed out, there are uh, meetings at the White House that are not just confined to a few people, but are in large meetings, very large meetings, that not only the heads of cabinets are there and principals like Homeland Security, but also their uh, heads of general staff. And there are instances where the heads of general staff are the chief functionaries within those departments are there and the cabinet person is out of the country or whatever. But we'd have to look back on over two years of those meetings to figure out actually what has happened there. So, in effect, we don't know. Uh, And it will be some time before we know. Now, as we look at the polling between now and the midterm, we'll find out if these revelations had any effect on the uh, polling numbers of D.J. Trump. As pointed out, uh, I believe it was in the uh, NBC Roundtable, one of the uh, correspondents Some of this information had been out since 2016. In other words, it was already public knowledge. And how does this play into this entire scenario that you have an administration, unlike Tricky Dicks, where you had to cover up the burglary, etc., some dirty tricks. But here you had information reported widely in the campaign everything from the Access Hollywood tapes onward. And you have had the uh, investigation by uh, Mueller and uh, as a special prosecutor, a grand jury there, the former campaign manager, Mansford, convicted of eight felonies. And the president's uh, lawyer for a decade reaching a plea deal, and several others reaching plea deals with the special prosecutor. You did have that during the uh, Watergate, because you had the grand jury there uh, that uh, was in uh, Washington. I think there was more than one, but one was under the leadership of Maximum John Sirica. And that jury uh, worked, uh, composed of D.C. residents, who at the time were... predominantly followers of O.J. Simpson. And the people, as they were indicted, were uh, deposited in the D.C. jail with the general population. In other words, they were there as a holding uh, situation before they were uh, transported to uh, federal facilities. So that in itself was a little different situation from what we have today. Let me move on to uh, some of the... uh, articles here uh, from the Washington Post. We'll come back here. We'll do the Palestinian one. Palestinian slam uh, U.S. vicious uh, blackmail as uh, their Washington office is a closed down. Palestinian officials on Monday vowed not to be into what they call the Trump administration bullying tactics after being notified that their office in Washington would be shut down and the blocking of uh, their case against the uh, against Israel at the International uh, Criminal Court. Chief Palestinian negotiators uh, uh, Sab, excuse me, Eckhart uh, said he had been officially notified of the decision, which is expected to be announced by uh, John Bolton. Uh, Later today, 
He decried the move as a continued policy of collective punishment by the U.S. administration. These people have decided to stand on the wrong side of history by protecting war criminals and destroying the two-state solution. He said, told if uh, told by them if you're worried about the courts, you should uh, stop aiding and abetting uh, crimes. The move appears to be the latest in a stream of pressure tactics by the U.S. government against the uh, Palestinian uh, leadership. That's in addition to the uh, $25 million support for hospital levels in East Jerusalem. The administration had threatened to close the organization, the Palestinian Liberation uh, Organization's office in Washington uh, after the uh, President uh, Abu Mazen, our uh, uh, President Abbas called on the International Court to investigate and prosecute Israel for war crimes. The U.S. officials said the decision may be uh, reconsidered if the Palestinians end into direct negotiation with Israel on the conditions imposed by Congress the PLO cannot operate a Washington office uh, if it calls upon the ICC to prosecute Israel for war crimes against the Palestinians. In a speech on Monday, Bolton will uh, threaten to impose sanctions against the International Criminal Court if it proceeds with the investigation against the U.S. or uh, Israel. The U.S. would be would ban uh, ICC judges and prosecutors from entering the country, sanction their funds in the uh, U.S. financial system, prosecute them in the courts. Now, this is the this is an extreme situation. It is a perversion of the uh, entire uh, judicial process. As many are aware, um, there have been numerous people uh, prosecuted at the International uh, Criminal Court, including the late uh, Serbian uh, leader uh, there, and uh, Charles Taylor uh, come to mind here. Saab Arakat said that the Palestinian leadership would double down its efforts and would uh, submit a new uh, complaint to the ICC within 48 hours after uh, the Supreme Court's decision to uh, demolish uh, the Bedlam village of uh, Qam el Hamar. He said that the U.S. is not a part of the peace, uh, the peace process and doesn't even have the right to sit in the room during the negotiations, dismissing uh, U.S. officials such as the ambassador to uh, the, uh, Israel as a group of settlers pursuing a right-wing Israeli uh, agenda. Hannah Rashabi, uh, a member of the uh, PLO Executive Committee, we remember her long-standing Freedom fighter there described the move as a form of cruel and vicious blackmail. Such irresponsible moves are clear proof of the American uh, collusion with the Israeli occupation. She said the U.S. would uh, do better to finally understand that the Palestinians will not surrender, that no amount of uh, coercion or unwarranted collective punishment measures will bring the leadership of its people to their knees. The move was uh, likely uh, to uh, be widely w uh, welcomed by the uh, Zionist government, which uh, was on holiday to mark the uh, Jewish uh, New Year. Now, this has uh, very, very wide implications uh, for the International Criminal Court that sets it to Hague. The idea of sanctioning their uh, money as a uh, blackmail there and arresting judges if they appear in the U.S. It further isolates the U.S. from the International Court at The Hague. Funds, no doubt, will be secured from other nations, and at the same time, the judges uh, will obviously not set foot in the U.S. And we only we will see if the investigation goes on. 
and what it would happen if it does not go on on the reapplication of the charges is that the, in the credibility of the national court in the international sphere itself is at stake. And we'll update this as uh, needed uh, there. Let's go back now. We're sort of jumping around a little bit now. But we'll go to uh, Republicans running for governors. Look for su uh, success on likely areas, blue states. And they have an example. Uh, out in uh, Portland, Oregon. They have a Republican candidate out there who claims to support same-sex marriage, abortion rights, uh, Newt uh, Beulah, I suppose, uh, steps to the mic in a recent campaign event and promised opportunity will replace poverty, hope will replace despair in the state of elected Beulah. Added he would uh, govern with an open mind and a caring heart. I guess that is a kind of... Uh, uh, a take from the kind and general, uh, general Republican uh, that G.W. Bush tried to put forward. He was speaking in a working class neighborhood. Rachel Dixon uh, s slipped uh, into the audience and frequently nodded her approval. This was notable considering that Dixon is the vice chair of the uh, Monmouth County uh, Democrats in a year in which Democrats hoped to punish Republicans up and down the ballot because of disillusionment with uh, D.J. Trump. There are Republicans I know for sure that would never vote for this person, Dixon 51 said. But when I look at the man and his voting record, I don't say, gosh, I'm scared to be in the room with this guy. Rebuta, and uh, he is an orthopedic surgeon, state legislature, is trying to distance himself from Trump. Even Dixon's non-committal reaction represents a major victory in his uphill battle to become the first Republican to win uh, a governorship in Oregon since uh, 1982. There was a recession in 1982. Also, uh, the sort of reaction that is giving Democrats fits as a moderate uh, GOP candidate or uh, proving uh, to be resilient in unexpected places in as much as uh, Republican Party shifts to the right. To the right, with 32 uh, gubernatorial candidates on the ballot nationwide, Democrats are expected to make uh, gains and open seats. Several Republican incumbents, uh, Remus in Illinois and uh, Boss Walker in Wisconsin. Recent polls suggest that Larry Hogan of Maryland and old Charlie Baker in uh, Massachusetts and Phil Scott of Vermont uh, all up for re-election this fall uh, in states carried uh, by Clinton remain uh, amongst the most popular government, governors in the country and a favorite to win re-election. This is a, is a situation that shouldn't happen particularly in Maryland. Our own Ben Jealous of course is running in Maryland against uh, Hogan, a mouthpiece of the Trump administration. This is one of the things that voters, as they become much more educated and much more mature in their vote, understand that across the country, from Maryland to California, D.J. Trump has nationalized this campaign. He's going into various congressional districts to campaign for Republicans as a national ticket. And in the very red states, uh, this is happening, and in some of the purple states. Now, in Maryland, you probably will not see D.J. Trump. You definitely will not see him in the Commonwealth. Charlie Baker will be there by himself. But the problem is that they are members of that party. And this is not the day of the moderate, quote-unquote, Republican. This is the day of the rabid Republican and of the Republicans that are supporting the agenda of D.J. Trump. And this has to be hammered home in all of these states, in hammered home uh, daily. Not necessarily attacking D.J. Trump, but attacking the Republican Party, 
that nationalizes the ticket. In other words, what McConnell does, what the retiring Ryan does, what the heads of various committees in both the House and Senate have done are a matter of record. And also the Judge Kavanaugh and Gossage. Those are the issues that nationalize the Republican Party. And this is what Ben Jealous is running against in Maryland and is happening uh, in uh, the Commonwealth uh, and also happening in Vermont. Vermont, the home state of Senator Sanders of all people. This is not the old days of Vermont when you had moderate Republicans running. The just the term Republican equates with the National Republican Party. And to give these people a free pass is simply unacceptable. Their success in uh, winning uh, and governing in the uh, as moderates is as serving a model of Republican candidates elsewhere, including in Rhode Island, in, in Oregon. Well, in Oregon, it's a different situation. There is a built-in bias in rural Oregon. The racists there, and that's why you had the demonstrations in uh, Portland, Oregon, are in a full uh, regalia, so to speak. And these are the same people that uh, took over the town there, the wildlife reserve, I should say. There, uh, and those are things that have to be attached to the right-wing movement in Oregon, period. And according to some guy named uh, Fry, uh, state legislature, Republican National type from Connecticut, the blue wall has holes in it. Well, the blue wall, um, this is where Neil Lamont, Neil Lamont has run many times uh, for office uh, there. Hard-fought government race in traditional democratic states are nothing new. In the Commonwealth, for example, there has only one democratic governor in the past 27 years, and that is an insult to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The stakes are high for Democrats this year as uh, the party uh, tries to form state-level uh, bulwarks against Republican policy. And that is what is at, uh, at stake. In Rhode Island polls uh, show that uh, Jenner, Raymondo, uh, Raymondo, uh could be vulnerable. She is the governor there. I think people will see through the Republican moderate uh, talks. Now in Oregon, there's Kate Brown there, who has a low uh, profile uh, leadership. She's going to change some of that. We're going to disconnect again between uh, the Trump operation and the liberal cities uh, there. She's been there since 2015. She's enacted free uh, tuition at community colleges, sick leave for workers, increased the minimum wage, and uh, some of the nation's most stringent environmental protections. She's 58 years old, and she's had some management of crisis uh, on the funded foster care uh, system. That's happened in uh, many, many states, and saddled with state uh, pension program uh, with a $22 billion debt and the homeless problem. Now, the homeless problem in uh, Portland is a business program, is a business problem. The failure of the business community to uh, provide adequate jobs. And at the same time, solutions for homelessness, uh, affordable housing. And you have to go back... Uh, 20 to 30 years in uh, Portland and the Burnside area there and the homeless and it's only quadrupled itself because what you have is is homeless people not only coming from other parts of the west coast to the moderate climate in uh, Portland but also 
from rural areas of Oregon, etc. And people that have fallen through the cracks because of the high cost of living in uh, Portland. That much of the affordable housing, no doubt, has disappeared and people can no longer literally afford to pay the rent. And this is the working poor. So those are some of the problems. Uh, what we would advise Ms. Brown to do is to craft some workable uh, solutions and go at them. Even if the programs will be able to accommodate a hundred or a couple of hundred or two or three hundred homeless people as a demonstration project to get health care workers into those camps and to see if there are additional uh, space in and around Portland to relocate some people and people that would, of course, want to be relocated with the kinds of state services that they would need, such as a medical care, food services, uh, basic kinds of services of that nature, hygiene for services, etc. Those are some of the things that could be uh, provided. And, of course, uh, various kinds of counseling, <coughs> excuse me, including job uh, counseling, and of course, coordinating with these uh, community colleges where it applies. Now, the negative ads here, and this is where people need to wake up the Priority Oregon is hammering Brown with a million dollars in ads, no doubt about this. They have to be exposed. In Cape Brown's Oregon, there are homeless camps everywhere. Foster care kids don't get enough to eat. Seniors are abused in nursing homes now. Uh, one more time, nursing homes uh, themselves have their own abuse record. She could start to crack down on the nursing homes some things can do. As far as the foster kids not getting enough to eat, I'm not certain of what is going on there. Uh, Beulah's campaign claims to have no affiliation with Priorities Oregon, but it is part of it. Beulah's message close to tracks uh, with uh, Charlie Baker's uh, and Hogan uh, remained popular since 2014, a, GAO, a GOP a consultant, Mike Levitt, who was Hogan's a strategist in 14, is pursuing the same role of Beulah. Says he has been uh, studying uh, Baker's policies uh, to address homelessness and affordable housing. I would advise uh, Kate Brown to look at the same uh, policies and see where the holes are. Now, it's a different situation, obviously, in the Commonwealth because of the geo, uh, the geography uh, involved there. Beulah, who represents uh, Ben, Oregon, in the legislature, has a record of opposing uh, Trump in 15 during the initial uh, candidate uh, bid. He referred to him as angry. But why didn't he abandon the party? I don't have blind law to anyone except my wife, according to Beulah. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right here. She notes that Beulah, despite his announced support for abortion rights, voted against a bill uh, to uh, protect uh, it should the uh, Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade. Beulah also uh, supports overwhelming state uh, Overturning, excuse me, the state sanctuary law, which Brown has worked to strengthen. So he's showing his uh, all progressive work we've done on minimum wage to women's reproductive health to uh, racial justice will grind to a halt under my opponent. Now, no doubt, with Oregon's uh, 250,000 uh, Democratic edge over Republican registration, many analysts. Uh, still think that Brown has an advantage. Well, she does. Now, remember, one of the things to remember, I should say, is Oregon has a uh, vote-by-mail system, so you don't go to the polls in Oregon. 
Uh, John uh, Della Volpe, a director of polling at the Institute of Politics at the Harvard School, cautions that the allure of Republican governors in some traditional Democratic states appears to be uh, persisting despite the Trump's presidency because swing voters prefer some ideological balance in a state government. Now, that is very important. Many of those so-called swing voters are actually... Uh, moderate to conservative voters. Whether this happens this year in Oregon could uh, be up to voters in the suburban areas uh, surrounding uh, Portland, including uh, Clackamas County, southeast of the city. The uh, county uh, tends to uh, nearly uh, support Democratic candidates in presidential elections while supporting Republicans in uh, state elections. Oregon City, where uh, shuttered paper mills over a mixture of uh, new uh, Main Street shops selling coffee, designer, and uh, marijuana. <laughs> Political divide can be especially extreme, at least there. Republican-leaning voters appear more energized to vote as they sense Brown is vulnerable. At the uh, Trail Saloon, uh, named after designation into the Oregon Trail, that brought settlers to the Pacific Coast. A bartender there named Fudge said she'd vote for Beulah, no doubt. And miles away at the Clement uh, Valley of uh, Books and Bullion, which sells antique books uh, dating back as far as the 17th century, Brian uh, Burglar, uh, a burger, I'm sorry, uh, spends up to three hours a day glued to t- uh, TV news coverage about. Trump, I think uh, she's doing an adequate job, but I would probably vote for her. That's uh, what big uh, 75-year-old book collector says. In other words, that's a tenuous situation there and will uh, continue to be uh, tenuous. Let me see where... We'll go now to Billie Jean King... uh, Serena and Serena Williams is still treated differently than male athletes, no doubt about that. The ceiling that uh, women of color face on uh, their paths to leadership never felt more uh, impregnable than it did at the uh, U.S. Open uh, final on uh, Friday, uh, Saturday, excuse me, ironically perhaps the route of Alpha Ashes Stadium was uh, closed for the championship match, the roof, sorry about that. What was supposed to be a memorable moment uh, for tennis with Serena Williams, perhaps the greatest player of all times, facing off against Naomi Oshka, a biracial uh, woman from Japan with a Haitian father and a Japanese mother. The future of the sport turns into another example of people in positions of power abusing that power. Lost in the craziness of the evening was the fact that uh, Oscar uh, played excellent tennis and won her first major title. Competing against her childhood idol, she uh, summoned her A-game and earned the championship. No need for any asterisk in the uh, record. She was the best player on the court. The case and the uh, cause and effect of this unsatisfactory sequence of events are pretty clear. But uh, that is not uh, what uh, many will remember. For fans, Oscar uh, Stella Play was overshadowed by the uh, uh, anemic uh, tennis rule that eventually led to abuse of power. The cause was the inconsistent application of the rule and the rule itself, which led to a warning um, that the uh, empire uh, Carlos Ramos uh, gave to Williams for coaching uh, coming from her player's box. If tennis would uh, catch up with the 21st century, allow coaching on every point, the situation on the court would never have escalated to the level of absurdity that, absurdity that it did. Every player, after all, still has to play tennis. She had to execute every point and should have never been held responsible for the actions of a coach. Coaching uh, happens all the time in all levels of tennis, so why just not allow it? 
the effect was an abuse of power. Ramos uh, crossed the line. He made himself part of the match. He involved himself in the in the end result. An umpire's job is to get control of the match. He uh, let it get out of control. The rules are what they are, but the umpire has discretion, and Ramos chose to give Williams little uh, latitude in a match where the stakes were high. Granted, Williams could have uh, taken uh, some responsibility and moved after the first warning. And speaking from experience, it is debatable whether she knew this warning, uh, this was a warning or not. Before the point and a game of penalties started flying, but for her, as for many women who have experienced an abuse of power at their workplace, there uh, is more at stake. Ramos treated Williams differently than male players have been treated. I think he did it. Women players are treated differently in most areas of women are treated in most areas of life. This is especially a true for women of color. What plays out on the court yesterday happened to far too often. It happens in sport. It happens in the office. It happens in public places. Only women, uh, a woman was penalized for standing up for herself. A woman faced down sexism, and the match went on. Women have a right, though, to speak out against injustice as much as a man. I found myself in, situa- in similar situations in my career. Once I even walked off the court to protest. It wasn't my proudest moment, but uh, maybe it was one of more powerful ones. I understand what motivated Williams to uh, do what she did. I hope every single uh, girl and woman watching yesterday's match realize that they should always stand up for themselves and for what they believe in right is right. Noting uh, nothing will ever change it if they don't. Women are to be taught are taught to be perfect. They aren't perfect, of course, and we should, uh, shouldn't should be held to that standard. We have a voice. We have emotions. When we react advers- adversely uh, to a heated professional situation, far too often we are labeled hysterical. We must stop. Tennis is a game, but for Williams and uh, Oscar, uh, it is their job and their life's work. Yes, Williams was heated during the match because she felt uh, Ramos wasn't just uh, penalizing her but was attacking her character and professionalism. Her true leadership and character were revealed after the match in the trophy presentation. She shifted the spotlight to Oscar and uh, she didn't have to, but she uh, did, as I know, That is who she really is. She knew it was the right thing to do. Serena is a champion. She was done and continued to do hard work. She uh, was right to speak her mind and put a voice to injustice. She was right to know when to call a controversial to to the end. Now let me just check on our time here. Run a little bit over. I think the uh, the numbers man segment will not appear. Nonetheless, we'll move to do the sport. Apologize for that. The college uh, football scores from last week. We'll start with T- uh, TCU and SMU, 42 to 12. TCU, Arkansas State, and number one Alabama, 57 to seven. Bama, Clemson, and Texas A&M, Clemson, uh, 28 to 26. Georgia and uh, South Carolina, 41 to 17. Uh, South uh, Georgia. Rutgers and Ohio State. <laughs> it was Ohio State, 52 to 53. New Mexico and Wisconsin. That one is lopsided scores, 45 to 14. Oklahoma and UCLA, 49-21. to 21. At least UCLA got the double digits. Oklahoma, Arkansas State, and Auburn, 63-9. to 9. Ball State and Notre Dame, a more civilized score. Notre Dame, 24-16. to 16. North Dakota and the Huskies of Seattle. Remember Don James when I do this. 45-3 to 3 was the score. Washington, USC. And Stanford, uh, OJ's old school there, but nonetheless, Stanford made it to the double digits, seventeen to three. 
uh, Southeastern Louisiana and LSU. They were shut out by LSU 31 zip. William and Mary and Virginia Tech 62 to 17. Virginia Tech, Penn State and Pittsburgh. Penn State 51 to 6. Youngstown State in West Virginia. West Virginia 52 to 17. Uh, Michigan State and Arizona State. Arizona pulled it out 16 to 13. Mississippi State and a Kansas State is Mississippi State 31 to 10. South Carolina and UCF. South Carolina was shut out 38 zip. University of Connecticut and Boise State. It was Boise State 62 to 7. Western Michigan and Michigan. Michigan 49 to 3. Savannah State and the Hurricanes of Miami. 77 zip. Savannah State was shut out. Portland State and Oregon. Uh, the Ducks marched on. Uh, I don't know if it was in the rain or not. 62 to 14. And finally, Kentucky and uh, Florida. It was Kentucky uh, 27 to 7. Those were the scores. On to Major League Baseball on Sunday. We have Cleveland and uh, in Toronto. Blue Jays are 6 to 2. The Cardinals were in the Motor City. Cardinals 5 to 2. The Phillies were in New York. Mets 6 to 4. Phillies have cooled off. They were hot. The Orioles and Rays in Florida. Rays 8 to 3. The Angels and White Sox on the south side of Chicago. And the White Sox were, were shut out uh, one zip by the Angels. The Giants and Brewers in Milwaukee. Brewers 6 to 3. The Royals in the Twin Cities, Twins 3-1. to one. The Dodgers and Rockies in the Mile High City, Denver. Dodgers 9-6. to six. Mr. Hill was a winner. Mr. Anderson was a loser. Mr. Alexander got the save. The Yankees and Mariners in a Seattle. Very close game there, one we tuned into. 3-2 uh, to two was the score of the Mariners. And let's see. The Rangers and Athletics in Oakland. Oakland has been winning lately. 7-3 to three to score. Athletics of Oakland. The Padres and uh, Reds in Cincy. Padres are 7-6. to six. Atlanta and the D-backs in the desert. It was Atlanta 6-9-5. Or is it 9-6? 9-6, actually. And the Astros and Sox in Fenway Park. Sox finally win a game. 6-5. Hector Rendon was uh, the loser there. Hmm. Well, look at the line score here. I suppose the Astros 11 hits and the Sox 14 hits in one error. And the rain got the uh, Cubs and Nationals in D.C. And uh, the Marlins and Pirates in Pittsburgh. They'll have to make that game up. This will do it for the Monday morning uh, quarterback. We'll try to get as much of the uh, canned presentation as we can, knowing that we have went over. Have a good week, everyone. We'll talk to you uh, soon. And uh, 9-11 tomorrow. I don't know we'll have a special presentation or not the 9/11? We didn't get it in. New uh, DNA tools are available to basically identify uh, some of the uh, dead uh, fragments of bodies, etc. Something that probably is not universally welcomed by all the survivors of 9/11. General Kelly, General Mattis, and other people who have come out to push back on specific quotes attributed to them. I thought General Mattis's denial this week was relevant for what he denied, but also for what he affirmed. In denying that he would ever use contemptuous language against the elected commander or tolerate it mm -hmm. in his presence in the very vast Pentagon that he oversees, he also affirmed 
his commitment to the successes on the in the defense and national security space that this president has achieved. General Mattis mentioned that the ISIS caliphate is all but gone. He mentioned that the, the pay raises, the first military pay raise in quite a while, that defense policies are received honorably and amicably on Capitol Hill. So there are tremendous differences, tremendous gains. I think the president's uh, consternation probably derives from the fact that we always have a handful of sources in all of this is like the fifth consecutive book where it, it's basically a few people. How do you? Um, why, why should trying we to take curate their own images? Why should we take your word for that? You say there's what are you, you said five books. I'll I'll go with we had the Michael Wolf, we had Omarosa, we've had various reporting. Now you have Woodward and the anonymous op-ed. You say it's a few people. That's a lot of. You're, are you saying well, a, few a few people, people are the source for all of their, these no, folks? No, looking to curate their. It's a lot of people when you start adding thing. them up. As somebody who above board met with Bob Woodward to figure out what the book was about mm -hmm. or how I might help and came back and took that to the White House, certainly, as we all know. I and did, did you stop the president from ever speaking to Bob Woodward? Uh, why, why did you? I did not. I did he not. He seems to think there was a disagreement in that recording. He seems to at least indicate he wanted to speak with Bob Woodward. And, and then he said this week him. it wouldn't have helped. It wouldn't have made a difference. People write But he did want to speak to him. You, you but, guys stopped Well, the president him. likes to speak to everyone. And let me, did, you did you just not bring the request? Guys no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm on tape saying exactly what is true, which is I brought the request back and it was to rejected. I also have to, to believe. Uh, I also have to, to believe. To the president? That if you, I you're also, not answering whether uh, you no, brought the request to I didn't the, bring president. the president. To, I didn't bring the request to the president directly, and the president says that I that she could have because she has direct access to me. But all that doesn't matter. This mm -hmm. does. What the president said to Bob Woodward matters greatly. He said, you know, Bob, I hope the book at least covers this boom economy, the labor, the wages, the growth, the manufacturing jobs, the construction. I mean, you can't deny it. Even somebody's poison pen in an anonymous op-ed or the vitriol spoon all day long on some stations, can't really touch the corners all across this country, Chuck, where, fe where people are feeling the economic boom, where they feel mm -hmm. safer and more prosperous. You can't touch it. In he fairness, has given voice and visibility to folks who felt invisible and forgotten. They are better off because of his policies. And that's why I'm there. That's what I care about. In fairness, actually, the, uh, the an unnamed person uh, who wrote this, because it's obviously not anonymous to some people at the New York Times, the unnamed person did write, don't get me wrong, there are bright spots that the near ceaseless negative coverage of the administration fails to capture. Effective deregulation, historic tax reform, a more, more robust military and more. But these successes have come despite, not because of the president's leadership style, which is impetuous, adversarial, petty, and ineffective. Okay, well, that, that is the intersection of arrogance and ignorance. And if this person really had the kind of courage and skills that... that some of us do. They'd come forward. They'd come. You would put them right in this chair today. You would have cleared out the whole round table mm -hmm. if that person would come forward. I'm sure he or she would get a hero's welcome, kill the fatted calf, roll out the red. But why, Chuck? Why? You're a longtime journalist, a responsible person. Would you have given anonymity? Would NBC have felt comfortable doing that if it turns out it's not a true senior administration official? Why are we imbuing credibility and authority to somebody who hasn't earned it. We can't run around all day right. saying facts and truth and transparency and accountability if we're imbuing credibility to every anti-Trump messenger that comes let me, along. Let me ask this. What kind of West Wing is, is, is it that everybody is quietly, Gary Cohn, look, Bob Woodward had receipts. Everybody's not doing that. Excuse me, everybody's not that doing that. That there seems to be, okay, everybody's more not than a handful that. of people leaking anecdotes. Um, venting their frustration. You realize a lot of people have away. been forced out and fired. You realize other people left on their own accord. Um, and it's tough to not be. Let me ask this. Why it's not for there everyone. More? As the vice president has said, it's not for everyone. I know that firsthand. But it is for those is of it? us. Let me ask this. Who runs the staff? Who's in charge of the staff? The chief of staff. Well, then, is the chief of staff doing his job if there yes, are so many rogue leakers Put me down as around? pro General Kelly. No, I understand that. Staff, but at yes. some point, who, who are these people that don't listen to him? Don't listen to whom? General Kelly. General Kelly. These are these are people in books and in I guess anonymous op eds. I'm not even sure they know the president or know John Kelly. It's not it's not clear to me. Who are I think motivated by conceit and deceit, and that person is going to suss out himself or herself because cowards like criminals always tell the wrong person. They always confess right. their crime to the wrong person. Do you trust everybody you work with right now? Yes, and I do. And I'll tell you Why? what happened this week. I'll tell you what happened this week. The team tightened up even more because of all of this. Folks who don't even work together because they deal in different portfolios, different issues, folks who don't know each other that well, some new, some who have been around as an unbroken thread from the campaign like me. Uh, we are tighter this week because we are so joined in our outrage 
And yes, I hope the person, I hope we learn the identity of the person, but why elevate the person? I'm more interested in giving voice and visibility to folks who have felt forgotten for so many years. Do you understand the president doesn't trust the staff right now? Uh, I think the president, I think the president should have real concerns about uh, having large meetings where sometimes there are people included or who are substituting for other people that maybe he doesn't know well. And I think every president deserves to have uh, a leak-free, sure. uh, ridiculous, an, an anonymous op-ed-free uh, type of White House. But, Chuck... So are you going to fire what, leakers? What, are you going to fire these leakers if you find out who they are? There are some leakers who are long gone. They're just leaking now to authors and books, so they're long gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and actually, that's gotten much better. We've seen that. I think that President Trump deals best in, in smaller groups because he loves to hear dissenting opinions, disagree, disagreement among his staff. And then he'll have somebody who's uh, for this and for that on different yeah. sides of the spectrum on a particular issue. But he knows he's the democratically elected commander and president who ultimately makes that decision. That's leadership. Somebody surrounds himself or herself with people who disagree, but who try to brief the president uh, properly. But you, you're not covering all the good things. I mean, I just want to say let me, one thing let me to ask you. This. He called it treason. Why is it treason? The op-ed writer. It depends. If this is somebody who, in fact, has access to national security information, and the president's made clear, he doesn't want to be in a meeting with somebody who's dealing with Russia, China, North Korea, who has access to that type of information, and then is, is using it. How do we know but, what the person what, what gave? Is it in the, what is it in the op-ed that would make it treason? What makes make you, think the, what makes you the, think the four corners? How are we secure, Chuck, that the four corners of any op-ed is all are all that that somebody that who's doesn't have the guts and the courage to come out and put their name to that to that uh, op-ed. How do we know they haven't promised other things? How do we know they're not taking other documents? We know that early on, so then, the, early on, it was leaked. The president's calls with the pre with the presidents of Mexico right. and Australia. Well, and we're not at war with anybody, so you can't really accuse anybody of treason. We're not no, at war. But the, but the president is saying, oh. Come on. And people are, are openly talking about the, the 25th Amendment and impeachment. It's such nonsense. Look at the spectacle on Capitol Hill this week. Brett Kavanaugh will be confirmed later this, mm -hmm. this month, and he will be seated before the October 1st Supreme Court term because that man is as qualified and dignified right. today as he was go, when he was first. Now, I, I know you back. want to avoid that, no, but I'm that's generation. I'm, I'm All this is dealing. noise, ultimately, in, 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 in history. Brett the Kavanaugh will be the there United for States, decades. The President of the United States wants the Attorney General to investigate. What, what law was broken here that the attorney general needs to investigate? It, it depends. There could be and there could not be. And so you don't know that and I don't know that. So he if wants, person, so he has ordered the attorney general? Nobody's investigating an op-ed. Has he ordered the investigation of who wrote this op-ed? I, I, won't, I won't talk about that. He has said publicly that he thinks that we should find out who this person is. I don't believe in giving this person so much elevation and oxygen, but, but, you're not, so but we is, all want to know so, who it is. So it's possible he's given an order to the, to the Department of Justice to investigate this? He, he, will, he has said publicly what he feels. You can roll the tape. He said it several times. I, I understand like, that. Should it be taken? Should the attorney general general take it as an order? If the attorney general, the Department of Justice and FBI feels like they have oversight over a matter like this, then they will make that decision. Do, it's an independent does the, agency. Does the president believe they have What the president believes is that nobody wants to cover what America sees and feels because of his leadership. There's no denying there either are or are not 201,000 jobs created. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wages and labor and growth up. Yes, yes, yes. We were told there was going to be a global recession. President Obama preened around, what's he going to do with a magic wand? He's going to create jobs, and he's doing it without a magic wand. He's doing it because he reduced taxes where President Obama raised them during recession, because he deregulated where President Obama added to those regulations, because he doesn't believe in some phony red line in Syria where we have a humanitarian crisis. This president responded swiftly and decisively against Assad when he gassed his own people, not once but twice. We know that there's a totally different ask, leadership Did he ever in even ingest, say, to Defense Secretary Mattis, kill the guy? I certainly never heard that. And General Mattis it's possible has, he no, said oh, it no, no. General, General Mattis has denied okay. what is in that book and is attributed to him. And I want everybody to read his denial and his affirmation. And there's a reason that people like General Mattis and General Kelly are serving this president. They don't need to be here. They, much, they very much believe in the agenda, in a strong military, in peace through strength, in trying to bring denuclearization, of getting out of the, 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 the wrong-headed Iran deal. Uh, Benjamin right. Netanyahu, in his Rosh Hashanah message, is crediting this president for being a great partner. This president kept the promise of, kicked out a Nazi, kicked out a Nazi that other presidents refused to, right. and he moved the, the embassy to Jerusalem. covers the White House for the Washington Post.
Mark Leibovich is chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine and is out with a brand new book, Big Game, the NFL in Dangerous Times. And Rachel Bade covers Congress for Politico. She is also a CNN political analyst. Uh, Rachel, I'll start off with you. We were just forecasting the races here. Uh, is Ted Cruz going to win in Texas? Are these seats something that you heard both party leaders uh, predict accurately? You know, it's Texas. Come on. Ted Cruz is likely going to win, of course. But this shows the energy on the left right now, and that is Democrats are turning out. They're, uh, they're energized, and they could really pose a threat, particularly in the House, though. And I think it was interesting, you know, McDaniel mentioned 50-50 uh, and that she thought, uh, you know, it's about 50-50 chance that they keep the House. I, uh, from Capitol Hill, I've heard a little bit of a change in tone in the past couple weeks where some Republicans actually think the House is gone. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the noise that's going on. You know, they have a story to tell. Um, there was a great jobs report that came out Friday, uh, record wage increases since 2009, and they want to talk about the economy. But everyone right now is uh, focused on what's going on, the drama, uh, the scandal in the White House, the president hitting back, the Russia investigation. And that is really drowning out the Republican message right now, and it's a big problem for them. Amy, is that also what you're seeing? Yeah, you know, the energy is the is really the key part of this. The president is very good at ginning up his base and going out and making sure that, as the um, RNC chairwoman said, he's got an 88 90% approval rating with his party. But when he fires up his base, he fires up the other side, and in fact, fires them up almost to a degree that, actually not almost, to a degree that's larger than the people who like him. When you look at the approval rating of the president, those who say they strongly disapprove him have consistently been bigger than the people who strongly approve him. So the intensity on the other side is really the big challenge for um, for the Republicans. Is putting, is putting President Obama on the campaign trail uh, a good strategy? You know, the strategy of putting the president on a trail is to help get those people who traditionally don't turn out in midterm elections, especially young people, to come out and vote for Democrats. That turns what is right now building as a wave for Democrats. If young people also turn out, that's a tsunami. The other thing that I think is fascinating about watching this president with President Obama, both of them are trying to do the thing that is very difficult for presidents to do in a midterm, which is to say, I want that coalition that turned out for me in the presidential year, in Obama's case, young people, people of color, in Trump's case, the uh, rural, small town America. I know you came out and voted for me, but now you got to come out and vote for these members of Congress, right? It, it's a sign that you respect me if you come and vote in the midterms. It's a very difficult thing to do, especially since Trump got elected in many ways by running against the very people that he's saying, please now vote for to come back you, to office. You even saw it in Trump's rally uh, in Montana just this past week where one of his arguments is now a vote for uh, Republican members in Congress or else I face impeachment. And right. yes, he sort of me. means, right. he sort of means, yes, okay, some of the progress we've made on the economy, nothing, but really it's about him. Right. <laughs> I mean, I do think there are two points. One is, I mean, we've seen over and over again in these, these um, special elections that support for President Trump doesn't necessarily translate into turnout for Republicans down ballot. But also, I mean, yes, his support among Republicans is sky high, but the Republican Party has shrunk considerably since he has taken office. I mean, these numbers... I mean, many of them are in that 55, 60 percent range of disapproval. Are Some of them are coming from former Republicans who are no longer reflected in that sample. So I think it's an interesting, I mean, especially for a general election campaign, I think that's probably the more, um, you know, prominent. Yeah, number, and, the right? more fa and the real fascinating thing about this campaign is the race for the Senate and the House are taking place in two very different Americas. Mm -hmm. The race for the Senate is through red rural America in states like Montana and North Dakota and West Virginia. The battle for the House runs through suburban America. And in one part of America, they really like Trump. In the other part, they really that's don't. He's been campaigning that's right now, right. just uh, North Dakota and Montana just this past week. Right. Mark, I want to ask you, you know, to Rachel's point, some of the scandal in Washington sometimes overshadows the messaging that the parties would rather have heard. With the decision for the vice president, for cabinet members to come out this week against an anonymous 
self-described Trump administration official and Bob Woodward? Did they elevate the story and make the problem bigger, or did they help themselves by engaging? Like I, I think they elevated it. I don't think there's any question they elevated it, because, first of all, the number of days between now and the election in which, you know, the core story about the economy, which is what Republicans clearly want to be talking about, is not being told. I mean, that was this is another basically wasted week, if you want to keep it neutral here. So... No, I mean, I don't know if they could have ignored it. I mean, I don't know if they had a choice here. But we do, we've seen over and over again that this White House has a knack for drumming up news that has nothing to do with the economy, nothing to do with things that the Republicans would rather they talk about. Speaking of that op-ed, it feels like at least Republicans on Capitol Hill feel like this was totally counterproductive. You know, right. they have been trying to bring the president to their side on things like averting a shutdown right before the election, um, striking trade deals, not blowing up NAFTA completely, um, Russia, NATO. And right now, the president has a reason to be paranoid, at least, you know, that's what he's telling himself. There's people in his administration who are writing these op-eds saying that they are trying to basically rein him in. He's not going to trust anyone. So this is counterproductive for Republicans, another big problem for them. It's survival instincts for his aides to come out and say that. The president does want them to come out fighting on his behalf. He himself is the one who escalates uh, these controversies the most dramatically. And he did it again this week on Twitter, on public statements on Air Force One, in the middle of this campaign trip, talking about his own competence saying, you know, he could speak for, 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 for uh, hours without notes to say how competent he is. I mean, he's trying to defend himself, and he wants to see his aides out there doing the same thing. David, um, you had some unusual warnings from the White House, from the State Department, elsewhere, about what would happen in Syria if you saw this offensive in Idlib. We know the bombing is underway. It seems those warnings are being dismissed by Russia and the Assad regime. What is happening here? Uh, why aren't the Trump warnings being heeded? Yes, well, I mean, the president has sort of signaled both ways on Syria um, in his time. And, you know, I think that he's uh, someone who said that he's wanted to withdraw. He's also said someone who's sent missiles into Syria. I think, you know, he's now, there's now reports that said he's committed now to a longer term strategy and it's not going to be simple. So, um, you know, his relationship with the, you know, malign actors in that country have not, uh, he hasn't been that, that clear with exactly what he's um, demanding. And what should we read into the fact that in North Korea during the military parades today, they didn't include intercontinental yeah. ballistic missiles? Are we overreading the pageantry or is that significant? I think you're seeing a, a sign probably from Kim Jong-un. I mean, he was there with a top level uh, Chinese official that's already uh, frustrating the White House, China's role with North Korea, maybe not putting as much pressure on them as he'd like. Um, to get serious about denuclearization. But I think Kim Jong-un is reading the signs that President Trump canceled this trip of his Secretary of State to Pyongyang, saying there's not enough progress. Uh, they don't want to inflame him unnecessarily. So I think it is a sign that uh, Kim is trying to put these things back on track. However, I think analysts are right to say that we haven't seen any real progress on the denuclearization. And the more time goes by, uh, U.S. intelligence agencies are saying um, North Korea is not denuclearizing. They're not ramping it down. In fact, you know, behind the scenes, they're taking efforts to conceal what they have uh, and continue to move forward with the program. Mark, you just wrote this book about the NFL, uh, going from, from one swamp <laughs> to the other. Yes, you exactly. You compare them in, in, in the book. Um, but this week, just even this morning, you have President Trump tweeting about football. Why is this such a useful political tool for him? Well, I mean, look, the, the, there's the old saying that football, the NFL owns a day of the week. That would be Sunday, right? And what I've found initially just from running, again, trading swamps, as you said, is that politics keeps infringing, this week being a perfect object lesson of my football book is out and we're talking about politics. <laughs> President Trump obviously loves this issue. He has, you know, a lot of personal resentment towards the NFL he Why? thinks that because he's wanted to own a team for about four decades and the most exclusive club, billionaire boys club, the NFL owners want no part of him. So has for, for, for you, that's what it is. It's not about patriotism and the anthem. And it, the it's that, too. It is absolutely that, too. I mean, for the, my book, I wanted to like look into like what that world looks like. It's a very mysterious world. I don't think most people know what goes into running the National Football League. In, Mr., in President Trump's case, this is a culture war grenade. He feels that this is a winning issue. The protests are something that he feels the polls are on his side with, which it would seem he is. They, it is. And he also gets to be in the middle of the great spectacle of American life, which is football and politics at the same time. Nike also thought it was a winning issue, apparently. Apparently, no. I mean, what Nike has done and what Donald Trump has done and what Colin Kaepernick have done is they, they have sort of filled the vacuum of leadership inside the NFL. And the NFL has just basically chosen to punt Good, good, uh, good enough. Yeah. I didn't even do that on purpose. <laughs> totally didn't do that on purpose. Um, on this issue, oh, they, they really, they're still kind of doddering around. No one knows what to do. There's no policy. And so you have these other entities filling the vacuum. Rachel, 
Who was the 2020 uh, candidate? trying out in these Kavanaugh hearings this week? Who? Which one? <laughs> you know, um, yes, the focus was supposed to be on Kavanaugh. It became an audition for 2020. You had uh, Kalama Harris uh, from California potentially running in 2020. She waited about 10 seconds uh, to interrupt the hearing um, when they first started, when Grassley basically gaveled them in, uh, saying, we can't have this hearing. We don't have all the documents on Kavanaugh. It is not right. We don't know what he's really going to do as a Supreme Court justice until we get these documents. Mm -hmm. That was obviously followed up by Cory Booker, uh, who is also a potential right. um, candidate in 2020 in his Spartacus moment, where he said, I'm going to release a whole bunch of uh, confidential information that the Senate panel didn't want to release. Right. Um, of course, some of those had already been released, so he kind of looked a little silly in that it's a moment. Bit of a bit of a yeah. kerfluffle. But, but but on that, some we, of them we, had not been. out of time. Yeah. Going through <laughs> this. We keep going forever. We, we have to wrap you on the filibuster. We'll, we'll, we will be right back.